Open your Bibles to the book of Acts. We're back in the book of Acts today in chapter 21. Don't have that much more to go to get through it. And uh, it's been quite the journey through this book, and we've seen so many different things happening. Uh, we saw the birth of what we know as the church, the body of Christ. We've seen the gospel begin to spread from Antioch through Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the earth. We are experiencing the gospel today because of what we see in the book of Acts. And we thank the Lord for that. But there's, I mean, Jesus is always the theme of every book. And it's manifested in different ways. In the book of Acts, we see it just in the gospel itself. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus. We see in this book of Acts just how very precious the gospel is. If there's one thing I want you to leave with, when we leave here today and when we finish up this book, I want, you to have a, I want you to have a higher regard for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to consider the gospel to be absolutely precious. I want you to consider it so precious that you would be willing to die for it. That's a big statement, and I understand that, and I'm not saying that, again, just to be sensational. But we see this in the text today that we're going to be looking at in, in Acts chapter 21. I want you to know that the gospel is worth dying for. The gospel of Jesus is absolutely worth dying for. So with that in mind, look at verse 1 in chapter 21. Let's stand again to honor God's word as we read it. We'll read a few of these verses and then just kind of unpack them together. Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and we went, our way, uh, went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed, uh, and we stayed with him. Verse 9, And had f he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied, while we were staying for many days, the prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the, ma the man who owns the belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but to even die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of uh, Nason, uh, Cyprus, an early, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Let's pray. Father, your word is absolutely in every way precious to us. We are so grateful to have it with us, Lord. And we can look into your word and see your heart and see your mind and, and just who you are and how holy and great and righteous and mighty you are. And Lord, you are a God that is worthy of our worship. In every way. All that we've done here today is for you, Lord, for your glory. Lord, as we look into this text, 
as we've read it and as we will look into it, Lord, I pray that we will see the preciousness of the gospel, that you have redeemed your people, Lord, through your son, Jesus, and how precious indeed that is. Lord, would you, through your Holy Spirit, build within us this desire for you and this desire to get the gospel to the world. Would you give us hot hearts and determined minds, Lord, for the gospel? Would we leave here changed today for your glory? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So if you'll remember, two weeks ago, last week, our students uh, told of their trip to Pittsburgh. It was a good time. Two weeks ago, we looked at the ending of chapter 20 and how Paul was leaving there in Ephesus and he talked to the Ephesian elders and they all knelt down there on the beach and they wept because they knew they would not see Paul again, their mentor, their, uh, their one that they, they loved so much and the one who had taught them so much of the gospel, uh, things about the gospel, the apostles' doctrine. And he said, I must go. I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to get there before Pentecost. So he begins this journey to Jerusalem. And it's a difficult journey. It's not like hopping in an air-conditioning car or taking a plane or something of the sort. A lot of it was on foot. Obviously, a lot of it by boat, by ship. And even we think on horse, horseback and that kind of thing. Regardless, it was a difficult trip. And on his way, his trek to Jerusalem... It was in his heart to see some other churches, some other believers, his family of God, those who had been redeemed by Jesus because they were indeed his family, wanted to see them before he left because it would probably be his last time again. So that's the, the narrative that we see in chapter 21 in these first few verses. But some things happened. He understood the preciousness of the gospel. You have to go back to Paul's conversion when he was Saul... If you'll remember the story out of the book of Acts that Luke tells, that Paul was named Saul, and he was a hater of, of Christians. He had this idea of God that had been taught to him by the Jewish believers, and that he could be, keep the law himself and be good enough to impress God, and he felt like he was better than others, that he had kept the law, and he was this stout um, believer in the law and keeper of the law. And he could not put up with what was called the way or Christianity because they talked about grace. They talked about this Messiah that came who was righteous and died in our place and took on our sin and bestowed his righteousness on us. And Paul was like, I don't need anybody's righteousness but mine. I'm good enough. And so it was his life journey to obliterate Christianity, to get rid of Christianity. He was... Have, he was seeing fit to, for believers to be killed, to be martyred. And they would stand up and be martyred. We see that in chapter 7 with Stephen, and we'll talk about him further in a moment. The first Christian martyr as he is known. And Paul was there watching this, no doubt, with his chest stuck out and with a proud look that, hey, I'm doing my job and we're getting rid of this thing called Christianity, this thing of the gospel. But lo and behold, when, when he was on the road to Damascus to, to kill more Christians or to obliterate Christianity, God, how I like to put it, God just zapped him. God saved him. God, and his grace just landed squarely on the heart of this man named Saul and changed him radically forever. Jesus absolutely changed this man named Saul. Later he became known as Paul, the apostle of God, the one sent forth with the gospel, with the apostles' doctrine into the world to teach the churches and to get the gospel to the world. So he was radically changed, and he went as far as he was this way against Christianity, he was that far the other way for it and for the gospel. This is the man we're talking about this morning who's making his final trek and his last missionary journey to to see these churches and these believers and to share some things with them and to love on them and pray for them. Then he was going to go to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Now, we could spend a lot of time in these first few verses looking at his journey. It's probably a good thing to study and just see where he went and how he went, um, that kind of thing. But that's not the main point 
of it. The point of it is that he did go to these places to give these believers hope and direction and love and minister to them and all these things. But in, at the core of all this is the gospel. Paul is doing all this because of the gospel. He knew what had happened to him. He knew what Christ did in his heart. He knew what a wretched man he was and what Jesus did and made him right before God the Father. So the gospel was precious to him and his life was about showing that to the world. So we're gonna, our launching pad is going to be that. I want you to understand how precious the gospel is. And when you understand how precious the gospel is, some things will naturally happen in your life, just like they did with the Apostle Paul. Some natural things that are happening. This is the first thing that we see, I think, in the text. When you understand the preciousness of the gospel, you will get it to others. I'll say this, and I will not apologize for this for a moment, that... If you do not understand the gospel and if you, don't, if you do not deem it as precious, you'll never tell anybody about it. But if you get the core of the gospel, if you've been changed, if you've trusted in Christ and he has dra dramatically changed your life, you're going to tell somebody. You may not do it gracefully. You may not do it with these long theological concepts and all of this, but you're absolutely going to tell somebody about Jesus. You can't help yourself. You'll look for every situation to tell somebody about Jesus. This is what Paul did. Look, when he, when, when Jesus saved him and made him right, his entire life became about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus owned him. He bought him with his own blood. If you're in Christ today, he did the very same thing for you. So his life was radically changed and his entire life was about giving glory to God by getting the gospel to others. This is what Paul was doing, systematically taking the gospel to the world. He would sit and he would pray and he would plan. We see sometimes where the Holy Spirit would change his plans, but he made plans to go here and here very strategically and specifically to go to these places. Why? To vacation? <laughs> no, to give them the gospel, to tell them about Jesus because they desperately needed it. We see it in our first few verses, systematically going to these churches to produce fellowship out of the gospel and instruction in the gospel, ultimately giving them hope in the gospel. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about when Paul left their in Ephesus, that they couldn't just look him up on Facebook when he left, you know, and friend him on Facebook or Instagram or send him a tweet or check him out on Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat. That's on purpose there. <laughs> and none of that. They couldn't just give him a call or fly to see him. They knew he would never see them again. And, they knew, and Paul knew the same thing. So he left them with something much more important than their relationship with him. He left them with the gospel. Look, folks, here's the, what we have to ask ourselves today. What are we doing with the gospel? Paul left them with fellowship and instruction and hope in the gospel. All these are outflows of the gospel. Paul brought these things to the churches. Why? Because he had been changed. Because he deemed the gospel precious. And when we do that, it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter what political situation is happening, it doesn't matter what race the people are, we'll have a desire to get the gospel to them. Hear me, hear exactly what I'm saying. If you do not have a desire to get the gospel to everybody, then you don't understand the gospel. It's honestly that simple. But if you have been changed by the gospel, and you say, why do I need to be changed? Because we're all wretched sinners, that's why we need to be changed. And none of us can stand before God the Father in and of our own righteousness, because our righteousness is as filthy rags. We're born as sinners, we desperately need a Savior. That Savior is Jesus, who never sinned, 
was tempted in all points, but never sinned. And when we trust Him and His work on the cross and His resurrection from the dead, then He makes us right. He places His righteousness on us, and we stand guiltless before God the Father. That's the gospel, and it is precious. And when that has happened to us, we naturally have this desire to get it to the world. Now, some people do that easier and better than others. There are some gifted in that area. But all of us should have that desire to do it. All of, of us. Regardless of what it may be. Look, I'm telling you something. God is sovereignly moving things around in our world, I think, to get the gospel to everybody. To all unreached people. And we'd better take advantage of it. We should have a desire to take advantage of it. When you understand the preciousness of the gospel, you will get the gospel to others. This is exactly what Paul was doing, and he put that above everything else in his life. I'm telling y'all, we are so bogged down with our natural lives that we're missing this. Our minds are so fixated on our 401ks or our vacations or, or our homes or whatever it is that the gospel has been pushed aside. And that's something we hear about maybe on Sunday morning, maybe not. It's something we talk about here and there. We look at it in our Sunday school material or something. But when we step out of the doors, it's like, here's my life again. This is priority. And the gospel takes a back seat. Folks, the gospel is not the back seat. It is the main thing in our lives. Nothing trumps the gospel. Nothing. And when we understand its preciousness, we will get it to the world. And you may say, look, brother, I just don't know how to do this. I'll tell you how. In one short little thing here. You immerse yourself in the gospel and it'll happen. It just will. You won't have to have this fixed, this canned um, gospel presentation. You won't have to do that. You just pour yourself into the word of God and understand the gospel. You can't keep it in. It'll come out of you. When you understand the preciousness of the gospel, you will get it to others. Here's the second thing. We're talking about a gospel worth dying for. So you'll get it to others. And when you understand the gospel... Here we go. You will place the gospel above your emotions. Now, let me explain that. Emotions are good things. They can be. We see emotions all in Scripture. Emotions are a God-given gift to us. They're a good thing. What if we didn't have emotions? We would be incredibly more uh, boring people, even more than we are, Right? Can you imagine if we just walked around with no emotions? So emotions are a gift from God. Now we have to learn to use them properly, how to emote properly, and we do that when we pour ourselves into Scripture. It teaches us how to use and feel emotions. But if we don't watch that, if we don't understand how to biblically use our emotions, they will imprison us in good way, well, in in and very good emotions and even bad emotions. They will imprison us. And Paul very easily could have fallen into this trap. Look, these guys love Paul. I mean, think about this. The church was fairly new at this time. We've seen how it was born, if you want to use that phrase. And, and we see in the book of Acts how it grew. And Paul was at the heart of all of that. At the heart of it. So he would come and spend time with these believers and teach them and love them and instruct them and pray for them and weep with them and suffer with them and all of these things. So they loved Paul. They understood he wasn't perfect. He was a human just like they were, but one who had been redeemed by Jesus and his love for them was obvious. So they loved him. And there at the end of chapter 20 where he was with the Ephesian elders, man, they, they were heartbroken because they knew their, their mentor was leaving. The one they loved, the one who had given them the gospel, the one who had given them this set of doctrines that the church would feed on for centuries to come. And he was leaving. And that's, that's heartbreaking, isn't it? We've all been where we love this uh, a pastor or, or a Sunday school teacher or something like that who've done, who have done similar things. They've invested the gospel in our lives 
And then for some reason they had to move on. And we weep. That hurts us. And all these emotions come up and, and even sadness and that kind of thing. And sometimes our emotions can get in the way of the gospel. And we can't let that happen. Paul didn't let it happen. No naturally human attachment kept Paul from advancing the gospel. Nothing did. As much as he wanted to stay there with him, and I think that's very clear throughout the book of Acts. He'd make these friendships, he'd invest in them, and then he would go about his call, and he would be heartbroken in having to leave them, but he did not let that get, them, uh, get in his way. I asked this question today, and folks, I could not be more serious about it. I mean, just ask ourselves, how many people have never heard about Jesus because we don't want to leave the people we love? I mean, think about that. How many people in Hampstead have never heard the gospel because we genuinely love each other and we want to spend our time together and don't want to go out into our community and even into the world? So the following question is, are we willing to put the gospel above our emotions? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to put the gospel above our kids? I've seen this my entire life. My entire life. Now, I've got kids. I can say this. I, I love them most of the time. <laughs> Who was it that said they, when you had kids, you understand why some animals eat their kids? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Sean, if you'll strike that from the video, that would be great. No, we love our kids. You, you know this, you can't put, an, um, you, you can't even describe how much you love your kids, right? You can't do that. And then grandkids. Oh my goodness. What is this? You all would tell me, and Ramona, about how, how what grandkids do to you is just on another planet somewhere. You can't describe it. Little Jonah went to sleep on my chest last night. Just the greatest thing. It was just amazing. But how many of us put that above the gospel? How many of us, if our children came to us and said, Mom and Dad, I have an absolute call to a foreign country to get the gospel to them. What's the first thing on our minds? Would it be, praise God? Or would it be, have you lost your mind you can't do that. You, you're, you, you've got to get to school. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to, you've got to get your career started. You can't do that. You can't be away from us. You're mama's boy. You can't leave. That's part of the problem. We've got too many mama's boys. The gospel has suffered because of mama's boys. It's the truth. So true. But I'm... Look, folks, this is a gospel truth. If you, can, if you deem the gospel as precious, you will be willing to put the gospel above your emotions. This is what Paul did. We see, look at, look at verse 5 and, and following. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. We departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until... Until we were outside the city, and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. It would have been so easy to get out there and to see those tears flowing, and they're kneeling on the beach. Look at this picture, praying, praying for Paul. It would have been so easy for him just to say, all right. I'm done. Y'all have got to me. I'm just going to set up camp here. We'll spread the gospel here. We'll, we'll make the church bigger, whatever, and I'll just stay here. But Paul had this call on his heart. His heart was on fire for the world to hear the gospel, and he loved the gospel more than his emotions. And he continued, And when you deem the gospel as precious, you will place the gospel above your emotions. Here's the third thing. When you understand the precious of the gospel, you will put the gospel above your life. And this is such a foreign concept in America, isn't it? 
It really is. You know, the first thing that happens when, when we begin, as Americans, when we begin to experience a little bit of backlash, I mean, we've spoken in depth about this before. There was a time where if the church said something, man, that had power and the world listened. You remember those days, don't you? We were riding high, man. We were in the catbird seat the entire way. The church, man, we spoke, people listened. Not maybe so much out of respect, but just there was that influence, that power. And maybe respect could have been. But that slowly began to change. And when it did, when, when, when some backlash started, when some even um, suffering or types of persecution started, and I say that word very lightly because we don't have a clue about persecution in America yet. There's parts of the world that are hiding this morning, knowing that if they open this Bible and they begin to proclaim it, and if the wrong person hears it, they'll be slaughtered. That's the truth, folks. But here in America, we begin to see a little bit of, of this pressure against us, and the first thing we do, the first thing we do is fight for our rights. We're more concerned about our rights than getting the gospel to those who are persecuting us. That's where we are. And when we understand the preciousness of the gospel, we will put the gospel above our lives. Now, don't think for a moment that I'm standing here saying, here I am, burn me at the stake. <laughs> Look, I'm as human as the rest of you. And that would be extremely difficult to do. Extremely. I mean, if someone burst in here this morning with a shotgun or with an automatic weapon because we are believers... To begin with, I don't think he'd last very long. <laughs> but, if they did, would I stand and bro pro boldly proclaim the gospel? I hope I would. So I know it's hard, it's difficult. But I do know this as well, that if you're immersed in the gospel and you understand what the gospel has done in your life and what it means for your future, you will be willing to die for it. Look, Paul set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. He was headed to Jerusalem with the gospel. Nothing, nothing could change that. So look at verse 7. And we're going to read through this again. Listen to what happened here. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais and we had greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. They're still loving on them. And the next day we departed and came to Caesarea... And we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven that stayed with him and had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While they were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And listen what, what he did here. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, which wrapped around, and they think it was like a money belt, probably even contained Paul's offering to some of the churches that had been collected. So he took that and bound around his own feet. Agabus did this. And hands and said, here's what the prophet in this sense said. Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So this man took Paul's belt off of him, bound his feet and his hands and said, The Holy Spirit has said to me that if you go to Jerusalem, you will be bound by the Gentiles. He was warning him. He was warning Paul, this is what's going to happen if you go. This is a word from the Lord himself. It was truth. It was fact. This will happen to you. So how did Paul respond? And if it was me, I'd go, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. I'm not sure about this. I'm, maybe I could just hang out at this church a little longer. <laughs> maybe I could eat more fellowship dinners here and that wouldn't be a bad thing at all, would it? It would be good. But how did he respond? Look at verse 12. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. Now he's talking to the church now. What are you doing by weeping and breaking my heart? You know what I'm supposed to be about. Don't make this worse on me. This hurts when you do this. Don't weep for me. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. And look at what he said there. 
In verse 13, for I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus. This is a direct result of what the gospel had done in Paul's life. It had changed him forever. He knew what his, what his future was like, what it was going to be, and it was going to be with Jesus for eternity, and nothing could stop him. Does this sound familiar at all? Like Jesus? Jesus knew what lied before him. He knew what he was going to have to endure, the physical beatings, the, the rejection, all of that thing. Then, then the cross itself, the crucifixion, and the wrath of his father coming down upon him because our sins had been placed upon him. He knew that, but he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem to accomplish the gospel, to fulfill that. Paul's the same way. He said, you're not stopping me. You are not going to stop me. He was absolutely modeled Jesus in his pursuit. Nothing would stop him from the cross. Why is the gospel so precious to Paul? Why do you think the gospel is that very precious to Paul? You probably know this passage by heart, but if you don't, you need to know it. It's Romans 6, 23. Just listen to, this is Paul writing. Here we go. He's been talking about the gospel in the book of Romans, our need for it, the cross and all of that. And then in verse 23, he says this. For the wages of sin is death. Let's pause there for a moment. You understand that, right? The wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, because we would not die if it were not for sin. Sin caused physical death. But he's speaking of spiritual death, which is far worse than any phys physical death. Spiritual death means complete and utter separation from God and His grace in every way. Now, the ramifications of that are mind-boggling. For the wages of sin is death. And here's the bad part. We're all born sinners. He said earlier that we're all born into sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Not a person that's ever lived or ever will live that has not fallen short of the glory of God because of their sin. And now he says, the wages of sin, your work of sin, is death. Spiritual death. Hell for eternity. Forever and ever and ever. Well, that's bad news, isn't it? That's wretched news. This is where Paul was when he was Saul. This was his eternity. The wages of sin. Paul was a practicing sinner as we all are outside of Jesus. He knew what, now he knew what his destiny was. But look at the end of that verse. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You understand what that means? It means that at one moment, we were doomed, we were children of wrath, and the wrath of God was going to be crushing us for eternity. You cannot describe that. It is more horrible than you can imagine. That was our destiny because of our sin against God. Then came Jesus. And stop that wrath of his father from coming because he took it upon himself. And when we trust in, in his work on the cross, then all of that wrath is gone from us. We will never, ever, ever face the wrath of God ever if you're in Jesus. On top of that, the grace of God in our lives are, is so amazing and we spend eternity with him with him folks our air conditioner went out last week and it was 90 degrees in the house it was miserable praise the lord somebody was gracious to us and gave us a place to stay for a few days god bless them <laughs> but we think about our inconveniences we think about those things they can't begin to compare to the wrath that we faced but then all of that can't begin to compare to the glory that 
lives before us in Jesus. Folks, one day all this mess will be over. If you're in Jesus, you will be in His very presence for eternity. His Word tells us that. Now, I don't know all the details about that, exactly how it's all going to play out and be manifested, but I do know it's true. And it's going to be more amazing than you can fathom. You can't, you can't begin to grasp the beauty of Jesus, the incredibleness of our Savior, the amazingness of heaven for eternity. This is why the gospel is worth dying for. Do you know anybody that doesn't know Jesus? That needs Jesus? Is there anything in your life that is worth you letting it get in the way of giving that person the gospel? Anybody? I could go on and on and on about the gospel, about what Paul said about the gospel, about how precious it is. And I want to, folks. I'd stand here the rest of the day and tell you about the gospel. It is incredible. But I want to share just quickly as I can about some people who are willing to give their lives for the gospel. We, we heard some months ago about Stephen, again in Acts chapter 7, 6 and 7. We're introduced to him in 6 and then chapter 7. Stephen was speaking the truth of Jesus Christ. However, his words were offensive to those who were listening. Still that way today, isn't it? The gospel is offensive to people because we are naturally sinners. We don't want to hear that we're sinners. People hate that. And it brings... It riles them up. This is what happened with Stephen. They put together a council and brought false witness to the things that Stephen was saying. Stephen proclaimed that God's own people were at fault for suppressing the prophet's call to righteousness. And, they, and that they even killed Jesus. So their reaction, Scripture says, was to gnash on him with their teeth. And they ran Stephen out of the city and stoned him through these Rocks at him until he died. Can you imagine that? It's the first Christian martyr. Then there was Andrew. Tradition says that Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross on the northern coast of a country. And then early writings state that that cross was actually a Latin cross like the one Jesus was crucified upon. So there's varying um, traditions here, but ultimately that he was crucified upside down. But it says that he refused to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus because he was not worthy. There's Simon Peter. Peter was martyred under Nero's reign. He was killed in Rome around the year 64 to 67. Tradition holds that he was crucified upside down. Like Andrew, his brother, he said to have refused to be crucified in the same manner of Christ because he was unworthy. One of the early church fathers, Polycarp, because of his refusal to, to burn incense to the Roman emperor, he was sentenced to be burned at the stake. Again, tradition tells us that the flames did not kill him, kill him so he was stabbed to death. We get a little more contemporary. Wycliffe, the great Bible translator, he was persecuted for his stand against papal authority. While he was not burned at the stake as a martyr, his persecution extended beyond his death. How, how mean can... We be outside of Jesus. Listen to this. His body was exhumed and burned along with many of his writings. The anti Wycliffe statue, a statute of 1401, brought persecution to his followers and specifically addressed the fact that there should not be any translation of Scripture into English. John Huss, we've all heard of John Huss. Huss was martyred in July 6, 1415. He refused to recant his position of the charges that were brought against him. One day he died. Uh, uh, on the day that he died, he, it said that he said this. is a quote to the best of our knowledge. God is my witness that the things charged against me I never preached. And the same truth of the gospel which I have written, taught, and preached, drawing upon the sayings and positions of the holy doctors, I am ready to die Today. How many of us could say that? William Tyndall, another Bible translator. Tyndall was choked to death while tied to the stake, and then his body was burned. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you've never read Bonhoeffer, you should. Bonhoeffer was hanged just two weeks before soldiers came from the United States, liberated the concentration camp in which he was held because of the gospel. Jim Elliott, you all have heard of Jim Elliott and the four missionaries. I'm just going to read this a little background on Jim Elliott, along with four of his missionary colleagues, was killed on January 8, 1956. While trying to establish contact with the, with the Aku Indians in Ecuador. Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Pete Fleming, and Roger Yurdurian had been working to make friendly contact with the Aka uh, tribe, which they had seen from the air. Though they had only met one tribesman face to face, they per had participated in trades with, a, with this tribe from a plain to ground system. When Elliot and his friends landed on the river beach on that faithful day, January, they were slaughtered by the waiting men with spears, speared to death by literally headhunters. Their deaths were not in vain, though. And listen to this. The widows continued to try and make peaceful contact and eventually won the hearts of the tribe. God has used this recent missionary martyr story to inspire new generations of missionaries willing to give their lives for what they believe. Just an amazing thing. How about the Nag Hammadi massacre? You remember this recently in 2010. On the night of January 7th, a group of eight Egyptian Christians were killed as they left their church after celebrating a Christmas mass in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. The motive behind their massacre, massacre is disputed, but it was carried out by militant Islamic believers. It may have been done in retaliation for an alleged crime against a Muslim girl by a Christian man. I'm not sure about that. Even if that was the reason, the retaliation was not targeted at, at the man who committed the crime, but at Christians of their, because of their association through religion, ultimately Jesus. This kind of martyrdom is going on as we speak. There are more Christian martyrs now than there ever been in the history of Christianity. It's an amazing thing. And why? Because they all deem the gospel worth dying for. That's why. That is what it takes to get the gospel to the world. You all remember this little, little petite teenage high school girl in Columbine, Colorado. By the time this shooter got to her, they kind of realized what was happening. I've talked to her dad about this. Rachel Scott and the shooter came, put a gun to her head, said, do you believe? In God. You believe in Jesus. Ultimately. She, what would we do? I mean, natural thing is to say, Jesus who? She said yes. Bam. Killed her on the spot. Petite teenage girl. Folks, that's a girl who understood the gospel had changed her. And it was willing. She was willing to die for it. I ask you now, do you think she regrets it? No. So here's four things, quick things that we need to know about this. We need to know the gospel. We need to pour ourselves into the Bible and understand what it means to be a believer. The gospel, you can never reach the depths of the gospel. You never can. Folks, I've, it's been my job for years to study the gospel. And the more I get myself into it, the more I'm amazed by it. It's this mind of treasure that you can never reach the bottom of. The more you dig, the bigger nuggets of gold that you come out with. You have to pour yourself into it. Then keep life in perspective. Folks, this life is fleeting. It's so, I can't believe how quickly it's passing now. I just can't, it's, it's amazing. I just cannot believe it. And think about this. How many, look how long it's been since these Christian martyrs, some of them we've mentioned. Thousands of years even. Life is flying by like that. It'll be gone before you know it. Don't waste it. Don't you dare waste it. Don't be so earthly minded about things that you lose sight of what it's all about. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus. 
Keep life in perspective. I told my son recently, he's making plans to do this in a new career and, and you know, some changes in his life. And I said, Jesse, I'm proud of you. you I, I love your drive and your zeal. But in, at the core of that, you keep in mind that all of this are tools for the gospel. You arrange your life while you can, especially to get the gospel and to give glory to God. Realize what Jesus has done for you. Know the gospel. Keep life in perspective. Realize what Jesus has done for you. And don't let anything stop you. Folks, it is my determination for this church to get the gospel to the world. If you don't want that, then find somebody else, I suppose. Whatever, however you want to do that. But that's my determination and that's what we're going to do. Because you will not regret that. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be difficult. It may not be real glorious right now, but it flat will be one day. And this world needs Jesus and Hampstead needs Jesus. You don't believe it? Drive out there one time. Make one mistake. Phew. Don't even make a mistake. And they still show you that they don't know a lot of Jesus. The world needs Jesus, folks. And we got to get it to them. Nothing, nothing, nothing should stop us. The gospel is worth dying for. So today, let's just get down to business. Amen? Let's just do it. Let's get down to business. Focus. Put all the junk aside. Focus on Jesus. Give Him glory for saving our wretched souls and share that with the world. Get all this junk out of... Uh, we do business here. We have to work through things. Let's do that in a loving way. But that is not the main thing. Right? It's the gospel. Let's get it to the world. If you haven't... You know, maybe you're just a pew potato today. And you're just, you come in week after week and you just sit there. Folks, it's time... To do some bacon, it's time to do something. Get up and do it. If that means coming to this altar and saying, Lord, change me, I'm, I'm just in a rut. Change me, then do it. If it means finally joining the church today, for whatever reason, let's just do it and move on with things. Let's do it. The gospel is worth dying for. Let's pray. Father, we